Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. I appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube as we kick off the new week. Coming up, it is Motivation Monday, and today we are going to hear from two women who have overcome severe eating disorders to reach the top of their professions. Now thriving helpfully, I'm happy to say, from Baywatch, Alex... <laughs> Actress Alexandra Paul will be here, as well as Olympic silver medalist Dotsie Bausch. She's going to be here as well as we journey inside the mind of a food addict and how they were able to pull through. Also today, Dr. Neil Barnard will be making a house call with a look at a major concern about the coronavirus, which is now mutating, casting doubts as to the effectiveness of a potential vaccine as promising news of a breakthrough on that front makes headlines this morning. Now those big concerns over mink farms in Europe as the virus rapidly mutates. Dr. Barnard, this is a fascinating story. Thanks for being here. It's evolving minute by minute. Plus, we're going to be opening up that doctor's mailbag. So send in your questions if you have something on your mind that you would like Dr. Barnard to answer. Go ahead and post that in the chat box or the comment section. You can also tweet that to us using the hashtag exam room live. But first, let's get caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Monday, November 9th. 2020. The U.S. is now the first country to reach 10 million confirmed cases of coronavirus, the nation remaining on a tear with new infections, 44 states still with high rates of transmission. And it was just 10 days ago that the U.S. marked its 9 millionth case. And over the last 72 hours now, nearly 370,000 more, pushing the total higher, along with almost 3,000 deaths. Meanwhile, 56,000 people are currently hospitalized with the virus, 11,000 in intensive care. Also this morning, drug maker Pfizer announced that its coronavirus vaccine in clinical trials was more than 90% effective. In other news, Americans with limited access to nutritious food are more likely to have cardiovascular disease. Examining data from 2011 through 2017, researchers at Penn Medicine learned individuals who were food insecure died more often from cardiovascular disease than others. And while overall food insecurity rates fell in the country, those areas where rates were the highest still had the highest increases in mortalities. Nearly one out of every 10 homes in the U.S. is believed to be struggling with food insecurity. And finally today, in more positive nutrition news, if you want to live longer, you may want to spice things up in the kitchen. Check this out. It appears that chili peppers may actually add years to your life. A new study of nearly 600,000 people from four countries, including right here in the U.S., finds groups who frequently ate chili peppers had a 26% reduction in cardiovascular deaths and 23% fewer deaths from cancer. The capsaicin that gives the pepper its signature heat has previously been shown to have anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and anti-cancer effects. The research is being presented at the American Heart Association's scientific sessions this week. Researchers, though, caution further study is needed. Let's move on now. UK scientists seek mutant COVID samples from Danish mink farms. Sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, doesn't it? But that is an actual headline from the Guardian newspaper over in the UK. And the article begins, quote, scientists in the UK are working to secure samples of a mutant form of coronavirus that arose in Danish mink farms and spread into humans, prompting ministers to ban non-UK non citizens from arriving in Denmark. Health officials now saying that the threat extends beyond the new cases and could pose a threat to the potential for a new vaccine. And to discuss this more in depth, we welcome Dr. Neil Barnard to the exam room live. Dr. Barnard, really, as I just said, this sounds like something out of a sci-fi film, but it also sounds very reminiscent of how this entire uh, pandemic began with the wet markets over in China. Very much so. And, you know, everyone has been really buoyed up by the progress being made with vaccines. That's terrific. And, and uh, the, the announcement that you mentioned just now, Pfizer is announcing that they've got a new vaccine that looks really good and they're fast tracking it. They're already manufacturing samples. They're already being stored. This doesn't mean that you can get it yet. Uh, it'll really be springtime before that, before that is, is likely. But everything's looking great. Just as that was happening, uh, last Wednesday, November 4th, uh, 
Denmark reported 12 human cases of a coronavirus. It was not the same coronavirus, it's a mutated virus. In other words, the genes have somehow changed, you got a new virus. So here's uh, Scandinavia, uh, just for a geography lesson, uh, uh, Denmark is down there on the lower left highlighted in green. And it looks like a little country, but it happens to be the mink farming capital of the world. And yes, that very same day, the Danish prime minister, Meta Fredriksen, uh, came out and said, the virus has mutated in mink and the mutated virus has now spread to humans. And from University College London, Professor Joanne Santini said, well, here's what we know. The mink are picking up the virus from people. They can be infected and then they're spreading it between themselves and it comes back to humans. So in other words, human beings working on the mink farms, the humans had COVID-19. They spread it to the mink. Then the virus doesn't stay the same. It mutates, the genes will change. And as it crosses between the species lines, that seems to be more likely to occur. And that can make it harder for a vaccine to attack uh, because it's not the same virus anymore. It can also, in some cases, make it easier to spread or more difficult to spread, more likely to cause disease or less likely to cause disease. So that's where we were. Uh, the same date, Denmark, made this decision that every mink in the country was to be slaughtered, killed. Um, and so they brought in uh, teams like this, and this is a huge job. Uh, up to 17 million mink had to be carted away. And they. Um, th this is something that has happened earlier because in Spain and in the Netherlands, mink were known to be able to be infected by human beings working with them. Um, and so here's, this is what has been happening. Um, in Denmark, and they, uh, they're they culling them all and burying them, killing them. Uh, it's, it's creepy business. Um, so that's where we were. And then on November 7th, uh, we had had uh, about a dozen cases. Now we're up to 214 cases in humans of the mutated coronavirus. So that's when the UK the following day said, all right, nobody from Denmark can travel into the UK and other countries are having similar uh, travel bans. Here's what everyone's worried about. Uh, and let me just quote, this is uh, Dr. Marissa Perra, from, who's an epidemiologist at the uh, French Research Institute, CIRAD. She says, every time the virus spreads between animals, it changes. And if it changes too much from the one that's circulating within humans at the moment, that might mean that any vaccine or treatment that will be produced soon might not work as well as it should do. That's exactly the problem we're having with the flu vaccine and have had for years. You get a flu shot last year. Is it any good this year? No. They'll, they'll say you've got to get a whole new one because the flu is not the same anymore. Whether this presents a huge problem or a small problem really depends on where the mutations occur. The, uh, on the right of the slide, you see a picture of the coronavirus itself, SARS-CoV-2. And if those uh, little red spikes are what change, and that's what the vaccine is attacking, then the vaccine becomes useless. If the vaccine allows us to attack a different part of the virus than the one that is mutating, then the vaccine is still going to work. Uh, we have no idea at the moment, but we're in this funny situation where just as we've got a vaccine that's looking like it's pretty darn good um, and hopefully safe, we've got a virus that is no longer the virus. So stay tuned. Uh, what can we do? The lesson is the same as the lesson that came, that became when the pandemic first arrived. You might remember, Chuck, I think you, you actually had this person on your show. The LA Times, uh, a, a commentary in the LA Times said, we could have prevented the COVID-19 pandemic. And the way to prevent it was to recognize where other pandemics have come from. They come from having animals crowded together in such a way that the virus, uh, viruses, or in some cases, even bacteria or other kinds of pathogens can mutate, become more pathogenic, and then leap across pieces, species boundaries. And with the live animal markets, it's a perfect setup for exactly that thing. And that's true whether it's in China or whether it's in the United States. As, as you and I have discussed many times, we've got 80 of these in New York City alone. There's a bill that's going to ban it, but they're not banned yet. They're totally legal. They are operating now. Um, they should be ended. So not to get too philosophical about it, but when we bring in huge numbers of animals, 
to try to harvest their meat, their fur, whatever. You also harvest their viruses. And whether people are making a change for compassionate reasons, saying, I don't really think I need a mink coat, nor do I need a chicken dinner. I'm better off without either one. Um, or they're doing it for health reasons or safety reasons. Moving away from our dependence on animal slaughter is going to be a really good idea. Uh, just to finish up, let me come back to this diagram. This was in the New England Journal of Medicine years ago, and it just showed how this occurs. This is the reassortment process. Back more than a century ago, 1918, the Spanish influenza, Spanish flu arose, came from wild, uh, wild birds, presumably a wild duck, uh, which can settle down with a domesticated duck flock. Um, and can pass viruses on. In this case, the, uh, uh, the H1N1 virus was passed ultimately to humans. Then it, it, and it caused millions upon millions of millions of deaths because we had no immunity. Our immunity was sort of limping along then for the next almost 40 years. 1957, a reassortment occurred where another avian flu, a bird flu, combines with the H1N1 to make a whole new baby influenza virus that killed many more people. 11 years later now, did the same thing with the Hong Kong flu. This reassortment process is facilitated, facilitated when you have animals grouped together, particularly multiple species, and in close proximity to the human workers. And then the human workers are the ones who pick up the virus. They spread it to their spouses, kids, roommates, uh, community members, barber, uh, at the nail salon, wherever and the virus then spreads. That's what happened then presumably with coronavirus, except in this case, it wasn't a duck, it was a bat. And now with the virus able to be transmitted to minks, this is what we're asking for and the time is really right to say no. Um, and yet you could be on just about any highway in Arkansas and all around uh, the United States and this is what you see, animals all stuck together, ready to pass infections onto each other and onto you. So just, just here to cheer you up, uh, uh, Chuck, that's where we are. Yeah, I can think of more pleasant thoughts on a Monday, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, uh, let's let's follow up to this mutating uh, form of, of coronavirus, not to compare it to the flu, but we know every year that there are multiple strains of the flu and they kind of adapt that year's flu vaccine based around their predictions for what strains will be most prevalent. What are the odds that we see something similar here with the coronavirus moving forward? Uh, it's a certainty that there will be mutations of the coronavirus. The question is, how pathogenic will they be? With influenza, some people die of the flu every year, and the variants of the flu are either less pathogenic or more pathogenic, uh, one way or the, or the other. But with coronavirus, you've got a killer. And so that's where, frankly, we're very concerned uh, about not just containing this darn virus that we've got now, but the mutations that are inevitable. They, they, don't get me wrong, Chuck. They will happen whether there are mink farms or not. But when you bring animals together and then we transmit our infections to them and then the animals are test tubes, cauldrons, where new viruses uh, emerge and they come back to us in a new form to which we don't have immunity. All right, before we open up the doctor's mailbag, one more point that I, I wanted to raise with you today, and that is uh, China now is is really disinfecting their frozen food that is being imported from other countries. Uh, it appears, uh, based off of their investigation, that a worker became infected from pork that was brought in from Germany. Can you comment on this? Yeah, uh, um, this is something that we've been talking about for a long time and that China has been, been talking about. In the U.S., the meat producers on the one hand, are acknowledging that the slaughterhouses are probably the worst place in the whole country with regard to passage of the virus. And as you know, there have been hundreds of slaughterhouse workers dead and far more infected, and even some of the inspectors have died from it. Uh, the industry here has tried to um, minimize it in, the, in their announcements saying you should be safe. Uh, scientists don't buy that at all. A virus uh, can be transmitted to meat, and when the meat is refrigerated and frozen, which is the way it's always transported one or the other, uh, the viruses are preserved and then they become a fomite where it's not that you then swallow it, it's that the meat comes into your house and it's on your kitchen counter 
and then you touch it and you touch your eye, touch your face. Mm -hmm. So what in, in China, they've been dealing with this now for months where uh, salmon or chicken products um, have been shown to be infected and they don't, they don't want them anymore. And so they've blocked importations of a number of these foods. The current one was, uh, if I understand right, it was pig knuckles. And they are now saying, all right, these products are gonna come in. We have to have a national disinfection point. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but this is the idea. Instead of just saying we don't want that those foods, um, they're going to import them, but then try to disinfect everything. We'll see how far they get with that. All right. Uh, Motivation Monday in just a little bit with Alexandra Paul and Dotsie Bausch. But first, let's go ahead and open up the doctor's mailbag, Dr. Barnard. Time for your first question of the week. And this continues our discussion surrounding National Diabetes Awareness Month. It comes to us from Marco. Interesting nutrition question here. He writes, why is bread discussed so much when talking about diabetes? Is it particularly harmful? Uh, great question. No, bread is not particularly harmful, but it's been discussed in large part because of the old, the older way of, of understanding diabetes, which has turned out to be a little bit of a myth. The old understanding was if you eat too much sugar, it'll increase your blood sugar and you'll get diabetes. Um, and in fact, all of the diabetes organizations have been trying to point out that sugar does not cause diabetes. If you go to the American Diabetes Association website, they will call that a myth. But when you digest bread or any other starchy food, glucose molecules, sugar molecules come out as it digests. That's not bad, that's good, um, because those, are, those glucose molecules power the cells of your body, they power your brain and your muscles and everything. Um, but people have naively thought, well, if I eat more bread, then I'll get more sugar in my blood, that's a problem. The problem that can occur really with bread, in my view, is number one, what's on your bread? Um, what's on people's bread is often grilled cheese or salami or big uh, a big spread of mayo or something like that. Those fatty foods are what really trigger the insulin resistance that, that causes it. Um, that doesn't mean that you want to eat unlimited quantities of anything. And some breads are have fat added to them as they're baked. That's not so good. All right. Dr. Barnard, big night starting tonight. Uh, you're kicking off your three-week series, Your Body in Balance Tackling Diabetes. How appropriate. Um, so people are going to get the opportunity to really go in depth with you and other experts about this. Um, and this is all based off of your new book by the same name, Your Body in Balance. Uh, thank you. Yes, I have a copy here somewhere. Um, tonight, we are going to be kicking off a three-part series. Um, I'm going to be speaking. Mark Ramirez from Detroit is going to share his incredible success um, and all the participants are actually going to be able to get a copy of, here it is, Your Body in Balance, um, with recipes um, done by Lindsay S. Nixon. And our, our goal is to try to pack into three quick sessions everything that you need to know to feel confident about tackling your diabetes, getting it under better control, and if all goes well, getting rid of it completely. So uh, that starts tonight. Outstanding. Head over to pcrm.org slash events. It is not too late to register, so go ahead and sign up for that right now. pcrm.org slash events. Dr. Barnard, thank you so very much as always. Thank you, Chuck. All right. And if we did not get to your question today, don't worry. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So keep on posting them in the comment section or the chat box. You can also tweet them to at PCRM or at Chuck Carroll WLC. Just make sure, as always, you use that hashtag exam room live. All right. It is Motivation Monday time here on the exam room live. And for that, we are going to go inside the mind of a food addict. Three of them, actually. Before winning a silver medal at the 2012 Olympics, Dotsi Bausch struggled mightily with anorexia. Likewise, before donning the iconic red swimsuit on the series Baywatch, Alexandra Paul was fighting bulimia. But today, both have gotten their disorders under control and are clearly living their best lives, thanks in large part to a plant-based diet. I had the opportunity recently to speak with both of them on the exam room podcast about their experiences. And what struck me was how similar they were to my own as a compulsive eater. When I was 420 pounds, you would think that they would be, the differences would be as great as the 300 pounds that separated us. But in the mind of a food addict, it's very much the same. So they too consider themselves to be food addicts. 
It's a very interesting conversation. I wanted to share a portion of that with you here on the show today for Motivation Monday. So this is an excerpt from the Exam Room podcast as we go inside the mind of a food addict. Alexandra, let's let's start with you because you are making your debut here on the program and it's it's only fair. I had no idea that you struggled with bulimia. And in the intro to the show that I was on with you, the Switch for Good podcast, you and Dotsie were talking about some of the things that you went through uh, with bulimia. And I'm just curious. I think that there are so many people who are listening to this right now who may not be familiar. They They know the word. They know that it's an eating disorder. But what is it really like living with bulimia? What are the emotions and the compulsions that come with that? Bulimia is throwing up, literally, usually after a binge, and it, 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 it comes from the same pain that overeating and anorexia comes from. It's just a different way to exhibit it, um, and it's often a more socially acceptable way because it, you can hide it. You don't get too thin or too fat. Bulim bulimics tend to uh, maintain a more steady weight. Although I have to say that just like any addiction, you start off using the drug or the, or the habit or the, whatever it is for a certain result. And after a while it doesn't work anymore, but you still keep doing it because it's habit and you're emotionally tied to it. So my weight, when I stopped being bulimic actually went down a little bit and stabilized, maybe seven pounds, five pounds lighter. But um, I was bulimic from 16 to 28. So for 12 years, I that meant that I would spend sometimes an entire day binging, then purging, then recovering and going to binge again. Or I might... Um, uh, spend several days, a week or two. I started logging it at the end and it was on average uh, once a week. Um, but sometimes that once a week was four times in a day and then I would have a very good three and a half weeks. So it really depended. And I was in therapy the entire time. And I also was somewhat honest about my issue. People knew I was bulimic. I would say I was bulimic, but I would never tell anybody right before I was about to binge. I see Dotsie nodding. I would never be that vulnerable to actually be honest before I was about to binge and throw up. Um, so in that way, there's a lot of secrecy involved with bulimia, as there is with anorexia and overeating too. Yeah, and Dotsie, you struggled with anorexia. I, to the best of my knowledge, there is not that binge component that comes with it. How did you view food differently than what Alexandra was just describing? Well, I can I can really relate to the secrecy of it for sure. I mean, that was a it was like it was a whole game almost became almost a game of um, you know hiding uh, all all sorts of ways that you you know because we eat all the time with our friends and family. I mean, it's very communicative, a uh, community based activity. So I was always having to figure out how to lie my way around. I've already eaten or I'm going to eat later or I just ate or I, just, uh, and so it was, it was very secretive. Um, my, uh, you know, I still say to this day that my anorexia didn't have really anything to do with food and to sort of, you know, mirror what Alexandra was saying earlier. It's just whatever, it was just kind of the, the poison that I chose to act out on my inner pain. I could have chosen, you know, a gambling addiction or sex addiction or cocaine addiction or alcohol addiction, or it just for whatever reason seemed to be the way that I acted out on my pain. And it really got, um, it really got going uh, when I was at a time in my life where I felt um, really uh, frightened and uh, so it happened during that period of time in my, time in my life where I felt completely um, just out of control, basically, of, of my destiny at, at that period of time. And so I started uh, the, the, the restricting the food out of a deep need to be in control of something. And so it started really kind of slowly, and then it, it picked up speed, steam pretty fast. But in the beginning, the first months was just little bits by little bits, right? Because it, 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 I liked the challenge too, because it's hard to control your food, right? As we all know, it's really, it's, it's really difficult to, to, um, 
eat less and less and less and less or, or more and more and more, you know, whatever it might be or throw it up. So, yeah, yeah I, I want, I'd like to echo what Dotsy said and, and uh, hear what you think, um, Chuck, is that it's really not about the food. As much as I insisted to my therapist that I was terrified of gaining weight, it's true. I was terrified of gaining weight. And I really felt like if I didn't throw up that I would eat everything in sight. People who just had normal eating habits, I couldn't believe it. I thought they were all lying because I had this deep need to binge. And if I didn't, I think it's like maybe going into withdrawal from drugs. If I didn't, I don't even know because I succumb to it most of the time. Um, and it, it really wasn't ended up being about the food. It was more about what Dotsie said, control and feel having something to focus on instead of the real pain. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I will, I will say that you, you think bulimia, you think anorexia, and then you think morbid obesity and superfood addiction, right? Which is where I was. And you would think that those three things could not be any more different, but there are so many commonalities that I just heard that we, we share here. And that is one, the lies and trying to hide it. Um, and, and I remember going through uh, to, to great lengths as well to, to hide this. And on those occasions when I was called on my eating habits, you know, whether it was going through the drive through the one time and having the person taking the order say, you eat too much. But I already had this story worked out in my mind that I could just rattle off that, no, this isn't for me. This is for everybody at the office, you know? So boom, there's the lies. Try to hide it there. Or you would just eat, uh, for me, it would be like a salad if you went out to eat with everybody. So yeah, just eat like you. And then going home and binging, uh, you know, when I was behind closed doors. And then Alexandria, you're also talking about almost this withdrawal that you go through when you don't do that. It was a massive compulsion to shove as much food in my face as I possibly could every single day. And if I did not do that, I would feel sick. Physically, uh, I would be just a complete jerk to be around. I would feel sick mentally, um, and, and I would just get really angry. What were the withdrawal symptoms like for you when you did not get a chance to purge? If I had binged and I couldn't purge, it emotionally was incredibly stressful. I hated, I felt like I was trapped inside a body that I didn't, uh, it's very uncomfortable to binge. So really what it is, Dotsy, tell me if you think this is right. Cause I know you had, you had your uh, bouts of binging and purging too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but predominantly your um, eating disorder was anorexia. Whereas I started as an anorexic and went to bulimia because I didn't, didn't have the fortitude that Dotsy took. It's very hard to restrict your eating like that. And then I, I wanted to eat, but I couldn't control it. So um, uh, binging and purging became a way for me to control, control things in a different way than the anorexia had. Binging is a way, was, it was mostly about the purging for me. So binging was just a way I could purge. It was also literally, my therapist would express, stop um, suffocating the feelings with food. And then you bit, you purge it up and there's this sense of relief and you're so exhausted also after doing this ritual. And then you don't think about your real problems because you've been so focused on food. I was going to ask you the question when you said when there was a time that I had binged it, but couldn't purge, you know, it was really terrifying. I'm thinking that there was a time, like I know when I set up my binges, like there was, I was not in any kind of situations where I was not going to be able to purge. Like that would have just sent me straight off the, the roof. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that was, Did you have, I, there were probably times where I, where, you know, you had to wait a certain amount of time. And then after that, your body's digested it. And yeah, no, I, I'm sure wow. I, I didn't have as much control as you, Dotsie. No, I just would just isolate myself so that both could happen in direct succinction and I didn't have to wait. I mean, because it I, I I don't know if I'd be here if I had ever had to wait. I mean, that just, oh my God, that just sounds, yeah. Going back to that place, that space that we were in, I just, I can't imagine not being able to, to purge exactly at the time that I wanted to. I also want to say that overeating, there's a, there, we can overeat at Thanksgiving and you can binge and there's a difference in your mentality. And Chuck, I'm sure you know, because you probably have 
eaten a little too much, uh, you know, in the last uh, 11 years or so, but it's different from the craziness that happened when you would go on a binge. Oh, much, much different. And I remember, I mean, I would plan my day out around my gorge fest. That's what I called them, you know, I, and, and I actually lived for this, you know, it was like my calling and I knew it was like, all right, if I can just get through to 10 o'clock tonight, I can go to the drive through and man, life is going to be good, which is, I mean, it's really sad looking back at that and how much I was looking forward to it at the time. And it took a number of years before I even recognized that this was a real problem. That's the funny thing about it. The interesting thing was, um, I actually lived with a family member who had anorexia, very severe, uh, was in uh, uh, a number of um, studies that were done here at uh, the National Institute of Health, um, just a few miles from my house right now. Um, and I mean, watching her whittle away to 70 some odd pounds when she's a good 5'8", five, 5'9", five, that was really scary. But I remember living with her and thinking, like, I, I don't understand how somebody would not want to eat you know, and so just that seeing what she went through, I, I think really fortified my desire to want to eat as much as possible and to keep that down. Because I, I don't know, like if my mind was so warped at that time that I was thinking, well, I can't be as bad off as she is because I'm not anorexic and I am keeping this food in. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I never, ever, ever had that desire to, to purge. And I actually think that it, it was partly because of that. She was living with uh, us when I was uh, early in my high school years. And those are pretty formative times. And um, certainly my intake of, of food was increasing at that point. So uh, maybe that maybe that did have something to do with it. Was, was, part, was, was your high uh, keeping the food in? Like, I, I know for me, like the binge, I couldn't get high off that at all. Like, it just felt terrible, but I got a great high off the purge. So when you kept the food in, like after your last taco, was it kind of like this euphoria of, it's probably chemical euphoria from from all the sugar and fat, maybe? Did oh, it? 100%. And okay. uh, that high actually started with the first bite. Um, and I remember, mm -hmm. you know, just, I, I would take it and I would just feel good. It was a rush. Um, and you know, and if I went a couple of days and I was trying to diet, um, and then I, I would finally give in and man, what a rush that was when it, you know, I hadn't had that fix in a few days. I remember feeling very sort of hyped up by just purchasing the food that was a lot of mm -hmm. times it was for me, it was all the forbidden foods. Dotsie knows how much I like sugar. So it was things like ice cream and cake and stuff that I was restricted when I was a kid. So it, it was in a way saying, F you, I can do what I want. That was a lot. That I think is why I chose binging and purging. And also because of the socially acceptable, you could hide it over drugs and things like that is that um, it was me saying, F you, I can eat whatever I want. Mm. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. So the taboo played a, played a big role in that then, huh? Yeah. For most people, it's not taboo. It would be more drugs or alcohol or, you know, gam <laughs> sex. But for me, it was <laughs> Ben and Jerry's ice. <laughs> I was a very, uh, uh, and as we talked about on the show that we did together, the three of us, uh, switch for good podcast. Um, I, um, I've never really done any drugs or even coffee or anything because I really felt was worried that I would let loose on those things. And I didn't need more than one addiction. Do you, do you still worry uh, about addiction? Do you still consider yourself to be uh, addiction prone? Or do you think that knowing kind of what you do now about the psyche, you could have that cup of coffee and not turn into a coffee addict? Oh, you, um, I am talking I, to I'm you. I'm a coffee yet. addict. So that's questions not for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really see now because I'm honest about it and talking about, I see other people too with clear eyes and I see that I'm actually not as addictive as I thought. Um, but I do, but I, but I do watch myself. For sure, and I and I have chosen not to drink coffee because, well, it's highly addictive anyway. Ninety percent of 
the world drinks it on a day, almost daily basis. So I just, I just would prefer just to stay away from all that. Um, uh, but if I were to drink a glass of wine, which I haven't, I think I've only drunk one glass of wine in my life. I, if I like the, t I, yeah, I think there's a little bit of fear actually. I, I'm pretty confident I wouldn't like alcohol. It's an acquired taste for most people anyway. So I figure I'm not even, and coffee's the same way. So I, I feel, yeah, I'm just not going to acquire the taste. How did a plant-based diet, how has that really helped you in your healing process? Do you think that you would be as far along in your healing process, Dotsy, now, uh, had you not turned to a plant-based diet? Yes. I do think I would be as far along, but I don't think I would enjoy food like I do now. Mm. I had gotten to a place where I was, I mean, I was a hundred percent healed for years before I found a plant-based diet. Um, but, uh, food was, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I thought food could never be pleasure again. And it wasn't pleasure when I was eating, you know, whatever I was eating that were all animals. I mean, you know, every once in a while I had a meal like, oh, that was delicious or good or whatever. But I wasn't connected to my food. I never cooked. My husband and I went out to eat seven days a week. Not, no, I mean, never anything. And this has connected me, plant-based diet has connected me to food and flavors and liking to cook ever so slightly more. Not a lot, but um, <laughs> we eat in five or six days a week. Um, so it has absolutely um, encouraged me to explore food and enjoy food and get excited about food. And like all of us, I pretty much lose my mind anytime I'm in an, a different city on happy cow, eating my way through the city with just so much excitement and joy. So I think it's done that. The plant-based diet. What about you, Alexandra? I love that Dotsie is, she, Dotsie has definitely got a healthier attitude towards food than I. I still um, worry that I'm going to gain weight. And it's probably because I'm still drawn to unhealthy foods like sugar. If I, When I'm eating a fully whole food plant-based diet, I don't think about food uh, and, and weight and anything. It's, it's a really positive experience. Um, so I think I'm I'm 95% of the way there, but I still see room for me to get better. But to answer your question, yes, um, a plant-based diet changed me a lot. And the reason is, is because changed my attitude towards food a lot. I, I wasn't throwing up. I haven't thrown up for 29 years. And in that, in that, uh, the last 29 years, I've maybe wanted to binge less than 10 times. So it's because I've healed really, and I'm dealing with my pain when it comes up, um, and I don't use food in that way anymore. But um, what a plant-based diet did was it aligned my values, my food with my values, and that just makes everything so much more beautiful. And like Dotsie said, it, it makes food it makes you feel proud to eat. You said, mentioned that too, Chuck, is that we're making a decision of love every time we eat. So it's, it's less fraught with pain. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's, it's pride. Uh, it's, it's excitement. You know, I, like I said, I still can't believe that these are the foods that I enjoy now. Um, but it's also a great safety uh, net for me, you know, like I know what I'm eating here is safe and it's not going to take me down that dark road anymore mm -hmm. because I do know I am terrified. Like I am just like that, that person who has, you know, quit smoking for 10 years and thinks that they can have just one. I know that I cannot go to that drive through at Taco Bell one time and be okay. No, I know that I will be there again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And so with this, I don't have to worry about that. And so that is quite liberating and, and I just, I love it. It's pride, it's love, it's borderline euphoria. You know, it's just the greatest thing in the world. There you go. So that is a clip from the Exam Room podcast with Alexandra Paul and Dotsie Bausch as my special guests there. So a lot of commonalities, despite the fact that one had anorexia, the other bulimia, and I was the compulsive eater who got all the way up to 420 pounds. The food psyche 
is just so fascinating. So if you want to hear the entire conversation, you can head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your favorite shows from. Look for the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee. Hit that subscribe button and leave a five-star rating. That would be absolutely fantastic. Very cool, also, the opportunity to, to speak to both of them. One, you know, having that sports background and, and covering sports and, and Dotsie being the Olympian. But two, you know, Alexandra has been in so many other things other than uh, Baywatch, including a couple of uh, made-for-TV Perry Mason movies. I grew up watching those. So um, the fact that she was able to share the screen with Raymond Burr randomly, um, that that was also really, really cool. So my thanks to them for being so open and honest about their experiences. And also, uh, they are very hard at work on shedding some light on the truth about dairy. So if you head over to switchforgood.org and you look for the Dairy Does a Body Bad report, They've compiled 45 pages worth of research showing that dairy or milk, in fact, does not do a body good at all. It shows the link between dairy and chronic disease and athletic performance. And even if you're not an athlete yourself, you really want to arm yourself with this information because when somebody asks you, say, hey, why don't you drink milk? Why don't you eat cheese? you have this information at the ready that you can just quote. So 45 pages worth of studies and research that are just fascinating. So head over to switchforgood.org to go ahead and download that. For today, that is all the time that we have. I want to thank the crew behind the scenes that makes the show happen. I also want to thank Dotsie and Alexandra one more time, as well as Dr. Neil Barnard for shedding some wisdom with us here today. And to you, my exam roomie, appreciate you tuning in as well. On behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. But until then, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.